We are continuing our study in the book of Mark this week, and I'm looking forward to, I think we've got two more weeks, and then we have Palm Sunday and Easter Sunday, so we're going to take a break during then, and then we'll be finishing up the book of Mark, so we're getting really close on that. Uh, I hope that you've learned a lot about the life of Christ through the teachings of Mark over the course of the last year. We're in Mark chapter 14, beginning with verse number 27 this morning and going through verse number 31, and I've titled this morning's message, The Propensity to turn tail and run. And you know I don't like big words very much, so propensity sim simply means it's that's the normal thing for us to do. We have a real tendency to want to run. So the propensity to turn tail and run. Let's begin by reading here in the book of Mark, chapter 14. Chapter 14, verses 27 to 31. Here's what it says there. It says, you will all fall away, Jesus told them, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee, Peter declared. Even if all fall away, I will not. I tell you the truth, Jesus answered, today, yes, tonight, before the rooster crows twice, you yourself would disown me three times. But Peter insisted emphatically, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the others said the same. Would you pray with me? Dear God, as we open up your word this morning, I ask that you will use me as your vessel. Help me to rightly divide your word of truth. Open minds and hearts to the message Help us to never forget, dear Lord, that you're always there with open arms, even when we in our frailty turn tail and run. For it's in Jesus' precious name that we pray. Amen. You know, in our text, Jesus has just told his disciples that they're all going to forsake him. Every last one of them are going to turn their tails and run. Uh, it's a pretty sobering statement, don't you think? I mean, these are his closest followers. If they can't stand with them, who then? Now, no one wants to be told that they're going to kick Jesus to the curb. But isn't that pretty much what Jesus told them? You're going to kick me to the curb to save your own selves. That's exactly what Jesus' closest disciples will very soon do. They're going to seek self-preservation over continued connection with their Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, these guys have been living, breathing, eating with, spending time with Jesus for three whole years, traveling on the road. When you're traveling on the road with somebody, you get to know them. You spend time with them. You talk. If this prediction hadn't come from Jesus' own lips, it would have seemed completely absurd to these guys. None of them wanted to believe that this could really happen, that they could really turn tail and run themselves. Peter put his feelings in, into words. When Jesus made this prediction, Peter just lays it all out there in his normally impetuous way. And he got a whole bunch of attaboys from all the others. Did you catch that at the end? And they all said the same. In fact, they parroted his statement. We're, we're, we're willing to die with you. You can find this infamous set of words there in verse 31. I'm going to paraphrase it. Snowden paraphrase. There ain't no way. <laughs> there ain't no way, Jesus, that I'm going to turn my back on you. These guys just couldn't swallow the truth that Jesus was dishing out here in that upper room. They thought they were fully committed to their Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I'm guessing most of us would feel the same way. We're dedicated Christians. I mean, we wear the name Christ. We call ourselves Christians. Of course, as Christians, we know that we may be called upon to die for our faith. <coughs> and we're constantly trying to convince ourselves that we would die for our faith. I mean, he, lived, he, he left this, the glories of heaven and he came to this earth so that he could die for us. If he loved us that much, shouldn't we love him enough to lay down our lives for him? That's what we tell ourselves. 
Jesus' warning to these men that he had mentored face to face for three years should serve as a real wake-up call to each and every one of us. There's no one here who can be 100% sure that they wouldn't turn tail and run if their life was on the line. An old hymn writer by the name of Robert Robinson captures this propensity to turn tail and run, the title this morning, in a hymn that's called Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. He wrote, prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. We're all prone to wonder. We're all prone to leave the God that we love. We're all prone to turn tail and run when our lives are on the line. We've all seen folks who had a hard time keeping their faith when the going got rough. I mean, they lose someone that they love that they felt was much too young to die. And their heart breaks and they have a real hard time keeping their faith strong. When they're forced to face infidelity or a divorce inside of a relationship. Sometimes the heart is broken and we have a real tendency to turn tail and run away from God. God, why did you let this happen in my life? When they work their tails off to get a promotion only to see someone else get it. And their heart's broken. When they've lost their job. And they have no idea how they're going to pay their bills. It's really, really easy to say, God, why are you letting this happen to me? It's easy to think that our faith is too strong to wonder. But is it? I know in my case, I'm admitting a failure here. I know in my case, I once spent a whole year being mad at God. And I know you say, no, you're the preacher. You, yeah, I did. I spent a whole year being mad at God. I had lost my voice and I had to quit preaching. And lo and behold, I was making dog food. I went through the motions at church. But I'm telling you right now, my heart wasn't in it. I served in the eldership, but my heart really wasn't in it. I was still saying, God, why me? I had a hard time talking to God. Whenever I went to pray, it's like, all I could say is, why me? I, I couldn't get past it. I continued to do the right things, but with the wrong attitude. I'm, I'm telling you, I'm not perfect. I've had these times in my life. I thought I was invincible. I mean, I was in my 20s, around 30 years old, right in that area, and I've been preaching for right around 20 years at that point. I started a new church that was flourishing on the island of St. Croix. I've been teaching classes at a Bible college, for goodness sakes. The church I was preaching at was busting at the seams, needing to expand. We were going to have to build a new building. And I was in demand as a revival speaker, going all over, speaking this place, that place, the other place. And then I got something called vocal polyps. Gross on my vocal cords. And they had to go in and they had to cut them off my vocal cords. And I couldn't talk any more than this. <laughs> I talked like that for almost an entire year. The church offered to keep me on the payroll, let me do counseling and just do what I could do. But I didn't feel right taking a paycheck whenever I really couldn't do my job anymore. So I went and made dog food instead. And I was miffed at God. I never said I was perfect. I was miffed at God. I kept asking God, God, how could you let this happen? I mean, I was serving you, God. I look back on those days now, and I can see how God used them to make me a better preacher and a better man. I admit to you, I was a complete idiot, and I probably told you this before. Whenever I was preaching, having come right out of Bible college, never having been in a factory like that. Do you know when you're working in a factory, they own you. I go home and they call me at home. Hey, I'm line three. What were you doing down there? You changed those bags over. Why would you change those bags? Well, we had a truck that was going out. And I mean, it would be two o'clock in the morning and they'd still be calling me. It's like, I got to sleep too. It, it, there's no end to it. 
and vacation time, you get this many days and you have to take them in this big a section and you can't just move your time around. Preachers have that pretty good. And my days off are usually Thursday and Friday, but if I need to take Monday and Tuesday, I just switch them and there's no problem. You can't do that in a factory. They expect you to be there. I learned a lot of things that I didn't know that I believe made me a better preacher because God took my voice away. But at the time, I was miffed at God. I just wanted to turn tail and run. If you had asked me just a few weeks before those polyps developed, if I'd ever doubt God, I would have been like Peter. Absolutely not. I'm a preacher. I will stand for God. I will die for God. I would have told you that even if I had to give up my life, I would have been faithful. And then I got these stupid polyps that took me out of ministry. And I started blaming God. I was ready to turn tail and run. Now, the disciples' situation was a bit different, but their propensity to wonder was just as real as mine was. Peter and his fellow apostles are all about to experience the unthinkable. Jesus would soon be arrested, tried, condemned, and crucified in the space of less than 24 hours. Their own lives would be at risk because they were his closest followers. Their loss was devastating. When believers go through difficult times, they sometimes turn tail and run. They sometimes fall away. Some will recover, regain their bearings, and once again live for Jesus. Others will not. The same trials that strengthen some can ruin others, just like the same water that hardens an egg melts butter. Jesus knows this, and he's about to encourage his disciples to pray that God will help them. He knows it's going to be difficult. Get on your knees, guys. Start praying. Pray that God will give you the strength that you need. Then after singing the hymn, Jesus and his disciples left that upper room in Jerusalem. They crossed the Kidron Valley as they headed toward the Mount of Olives. Jesus is warning it was stark. You're all going to fall away. You're going to scatter like sheep with no shepherd. Jesus predicted that his disciples will be so heartbroken at his arrest and death that they'll turn tail and run. They'll fail to trust and depend on him. They'll be so terrified at what's happening to Jesus that they'll turn tail and run due to the fact they're afraid the same thing could happen to them. As a matter of preservation, they turned tail and ran. Have you got the picture here? Are you starting to realize the title of today's message fits? These men were close friends with the Son of God. These men had been trained by Jesus. They witnessed him raising the dead, calming the seas. They'd seen him feed thousands with just a few fish in a few loaves of bread. They'd seen him cast out demons and heal leprosy. You'd think that if anybody had the intestinal fortitude, that means guts, to stand firm, it would have been them. But Jesus' warning will very soon become their reality. Jesus quotes the prophecy of Zechariah down in verse number 27. He says, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. They may not get it now, but very soon they're going to understand because they're headed to the Mount of Olives. Jesus is going to be taken from them. His arrest in the garden would catch them off guard. They would still hold out hope. But that hope was quickly becoming shaky. You see, their understanding and Jesus' reality were different. They fully expected Jesus to set up an earthly kingdom. They fully expected Jesus to defeat Rome and put the Jews in charge. Peter even pulled a sword and cut off an ear to get the action started. But Jesus put the guy's ear back on. And he let them know that this was not the path he had been sent to follow. 
The disciples wanted something different than Jesus wanted. They didn't want him to suffer. They didn't want him to die. They wanted him to be their king. And this was all really, really confusing to them. They missed the whole rising from the dead thing. So they're confused and distraught when Jesus dies. As a result, they turn tail and ran. If these guys could fall away after being mentored by Jesus, why would we think we'd be immune? It happened to Peter, who was known as the rock. You know, Peter, the apostle, the impetuous one. He was one of Jesus' inner circle. But here's the thing. Although they turned tail and run, or ran, they did not continue running. They didn't keep running. Look down in verse number 28. It says, just as Jesus had predicted that they'd all fall away, he also predicted that they would be reunited with him once he's raised from the dead. In fact, he says, go to, anybody remember? Galilee, Galilee and wait for me there. We're going to be reunited. Let's take a moment to put all this together. Jesus declared that they'd all fall away. The shepherd would be struck and the sheep would be scattered. But the certainty of what he would do on the cross and the reality of his resurrection guaranteed that he'd soon rejoin them. He'd be triumphant over sin and death. They all fall away. Would it be a, a, an eternal thing? No, it would be a temporary thing. It would be short-lived defeat because he was going to be reunited with them. I've got no idea what's going to happen in America in the upcoming years and months. It terrifies me. We're reading about Jesus and what he went through. We're reading about the, the fear of the disciples. I'll tell you what, America seems to be at a very dangerous crossroad. Christians are being persecuted right here in America, told that we can't meet, being arrested for preaching the gospel, for meeting in groups that they think are too big. Christians are being persecuted on American soil. We never would have thought 20 years ago that that could possibly happen. Islam is on the move and has basis even here in the United States. Not very many days ago, they caught people from Iran coming across our southern borders. Liberalism is on the move in America. They're trying to cancel culture, everything we've ever stood for, everything we've ever believed in. They want to change the world. They want to turn it upside down. Evil is on the move in the world today. And that means there may come a time when you and I will have to stare death straight in the eye and take a stand that will cause us to lose our lives for the sake of Jesus. Some will stand strong and lay down their lives for him. They're to be commended. Some of us, who knows, we may cower. We may be just like Jesus' disciples. We may turn tail and run. I'd like to think that none of us would do that. But if it happened to the disciples, I'm pretty sure it could happen to anyone in here or in our parking lot. Here's the thing, if that ever happens, remember Jesus took them back and strengthened them. Did you get that? If you happen to turn tail and run, if you don't have the strength that you thought you had, if you say or do something that you wish you hadn't have said or done, remember Jesus took them back and he strengthened them in spite of their momentary lapse of fortitude. All but one would eventually lay down their lives in the service of King Jesus now, while it's better by far to die and run into the arms of Jesus, as long as you have the breath of life in you, it's not too late to repent <coughs> and to turn to Jesus. He'll be there with open arms, ready to embrace you, ready to forgive you. Maybe it wasn't the threat of death that caused you to turn tail and run. Maybe it was the trials of life. Whatever the reason, if you've been running from Jesus, now's the time to turn and run into his loving arms. Won't you choose today to live for him? Won't you come and say, Jesus, I've been running away too long. I want to live for you. If so, we encourage you to make that known 
As we sing this morning, I'll live for him. Mm -hmm.